Thank you so much. I'm not sure if this works. Yes, it does. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here uh, again at one of the Muatin conferences. And I think the subject that was picked for this year's conference is very, very timely. Why do I think so? Because we see uh, two parallel developments taking place. One is the entrenching of a one-state reality with unequal rights and privileges. Uh, the fragmentation, ever further fragmentation of a Palestinian state. And the second one is the entrenching of the split between the two Palestinian movements, if you want to call it like that, uh, going hand in hand with two ever more authoritarian systems, uh, where even the democratic facade that we have had for a while is no longer maintained by now. Um, so today, for those who were not clear about that in the past, I think it's become, you can no longer ignore it, and that is there is a contradiction between upholding the Oslo regime, the PA's role in Oslo, um, on the one side, and the will of the people uh, that does not favor that kind of arrangement. In such a situation, you cannot have a democratic system. Uh, and that is one of the contradictions that you have been living that I don't need to explain to you. Um, but, and here we'll get to the questions you put on the table, what is the European role in that? Um, when we look back at the last few years, we see that the EU and its member states, the EU and its member states don't seem to have had any meaningful impact. Uh, they have remained in the back seat, they have given a picture of disunity, and they have been very ambivalent about where they stand, for example, on the two-state approach. So why is this the case? Where do the divisions among the EU member states come from? And what impact does the, do the policies of the government of Israel actually have in that regard? Uh, this is, these are the questions I would like to answer in my intervention. So what I want to do is uh, very briefly look at the European approach, uh, then go into the factors that limit the European capacity at policy making, especially with regards to the situation here. And then thirdly, go for a short outlook. Where are we headed? Actually, when we look at European policies towards the Middle East, Israel, Palestine, then I would claim this is one of the few policy areas where actually the Europeans have quite a well-defined, a detailed and a consistent stance, starting basically from the 1980 Venice um, uh, Declaration and going on uh, until 2016, Security Council Resolution 2334, for which the European language was actually very essential in shaping that kind of arrangement. Um, so Europeans have a policy. Uh, they do agree on the parameters how to solve the conflict uh, in that international law they see as essential. And they have held that position over the decades. Um, they have tried to implement that kind of stance basically through three main approaches. One is that they have rhetorically adhered to the two-state approach. Uh, they have since 2012 implemented so-called differentiation policies, and that includes the labeling of settlement goods or the indication of origin uh, of goods that come from Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Um, they have, secondly, uh, lent financial support to the Palestinian Authority, um, to the Palestinian Civil Society, to UNRWA, and thus have, have tried to help support the Palestinian project. Uh, now, others will look more closely into the aid that is dispensed here. I think it's important to see how much the approach in that support has changed from the beginning, a project that was focused very much on 
state and institution building to one that is now almost entirely geared towards just preventing the collapse of the system, just maintenance of the current status quo. And the, se and the third element of that European approach is um, trying to remain engaged in what could become, again, a peace process that is trying to set incentives for Israel and Palestine to engage in negotiations, uh, however um, you might deem that relevant in the current situation or not, but that has maintained part of the European approach. Um, what we have seen is that the objective that the Europeans have set for themselves has changed a lot. In the beginning, after in the first Oslo years, the Europeans were focused in contributing to the achievement of a two-state solution. What we see today is the aim of maintaining a two-state option on the table, and even that objective has been completely failed, one has to see. They have not been able uh, to maintain that option on the table. We see it uh, slipping away day by day. Um, you might say they have had temporary successes, very short successes, for example, um, contributing to preventing um, the eviction of Bedouins from Khan al Ahma. That was one such small success. Uh, but with regards to the larger trends, I don't see that they have had any kind of impact. That brings, to, brings me to my second point. Why have they actually not have a more prominent role? And thus, why have they not been able to influence the developments on the ground? Um, I see four main factors that play a role here. One is that the EU and its member states from very early on have generally refrained from challenging the US administration as a chief mediator. That has traditionally been the case. And actually, there are good reasons to do so, because the Europeans would not be accepted by both sides as an honest broker. So to play that role, the Europeans are not in a position to do that. And every time they have tried to assume such a position, for example, the French with their peace initiative in 2016, 2017, they failed miserably. At the same time, that uh, staying back, uh, as accepting that role in the backseat has also led to a situation where the process has been completely dominated by the US, uh, where the process has remained hostage to the U.S. approach and to U.S. election cycles. And the Europeans have also sort of seen it as an excuse uh, not having to come up with their own alternatives to the American-led process. Second point is um, the EU member states have hidden very much behind the EU. So it has always been Brussels that has been pushing for policies while EU member states have been happy to pursue their bilateral relations with Israel uh, rather than defending EU policies. Um, they have not consistently followed up on what was decided, what they have also agreed to, for example, differentiation. So when we look at the picture today, labeling actually is not implemented in Europe with very uh, few exceptions. Um, the territorial clauses that should be part of every agreement with Israel are hardly there. Um, so the picture is not one of consistent implementation and thus one that would send a, would send a clear signal to Israel um, or to the Palestinians also. Um, more importantly, I would say, or as important, is that the EU member states have not defended EU policies and have not defended the EU high representative uh, against all the smear campaigns that came out from the government of Israel um, and have done nothing actually to strengthen her with regards uh, to these policies. Third point that, pay, that plays a role here is that among EU member states, we don't have consensus. 
That is nothing new that has been there for a long time. We don't have consensus, we have consensus on the, what we call the acquis. We don't have consensus on how to move forward. And that concerns mainly three elements. We don't have consensus with regards uh, to the general approach. Is this about bilateral negotiations between Israel and Palestine, or is this about an international conference, multilateral uh, setting? We don't have agreement on the instruments that we use. Uh, is this mainly about pressure? Is this mainly about raising the costs of the occupation? Or is this mainly about incentives, embracing uh, the parties to the conflict? And we don't have agreement on how to deal with the situation on the ground. So do we cooperate with the occupation authorities when we implement projects in Area C, for example? Do we ask for compensation do we ask for compensation for projects that are being destroyed? Here, the Europeans are completely split and can't find a common line. Those are all the factors that have been there for a long while. What has changed over the last few years is uh, that divisions among EU member states have increased even further. And again, there are a couple of factors why that has been the case. Uh, first and foremost, I would say the divisive policies of the government of Israel, the, again, the agenda of which has been to correct what they see as the unbalanced approach of the EU um, and trying to prevent any kind of consensus when it comes to Israel-Palestine between EU member states, uh, to stop the efforts at labeling and also to get member states to relocate their embassies to Jerusalem to strengthen the Israeli claim on Jerusalem. Um, and last but not least, the objective of delinking the relations between EU member states and Israel on the one side and the Middle East peace process or the conflict on the other side. So basically they have employed three main elements in trying to achieve these objectives. The first one is, and that was was and is mainly implemented on the level of the Prime Minister, trying not to work with the EU, but trying to work with several blocks of countries within the EU, uh, trying to find shared interests with them, see where they share values, um, see where they have similar perceptions of domestic and external threats, and also try to bank on frictions that are there between EU member states and the EU. Um, that might be on domestic issues like rule of law issues with the EU Commission, that might be on foreign policy priorities have to do with uh, issues of migration, for example. Um, and actually the government of Israel has been quite successful to build these relations with blocks mainly the V4 country, the Visegrad countries, the Baltic countries, the Hellenic countries, and the Balkans. Um, they have also at times not so much worked on that state level, but rather on the level of leaders, and that was very helpful in building such relations with Italy and Hungary, where you have leaders that have um, a lot of, that share a lot of values with the current Prime Minister of Israel. The second element of that has been a campaign that has been mainly led by the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in Israel, uh, Gilad Erdan, and allied or associated uh, NGOs, um, and that is a general smear, campa smear campaign that aims at delegitimizing the PA, UNRWA, the Palestinian Civil Society, and everybody who works with them, including progressive Israelis and critics of the occupation. Um, and that actually has been quite successful, I would say, in putting supporters of Palestinian aspirations on the defensive and make them busy with all the accusations that come rather than being able to set the agenda themselves and work on positive and constructive issues. 
And the third one, the third element in that has been um, to delegitimize any criticism of Israel and the government of Israel's policies as anti-Semitism through the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, an alliance that has been pushed by the government of Israel and uh, that has also led to the establishing of so-called anti-Semitism coordinators um, on the level of the EU and in almost all EU member states. And it is these anti-Semitism coordinators who today serve as a venue entry point for Israeli government policy into European member states and again serve as an entry point also for the other elements that I've been mentioning, especially uh, Gilad Erdan's smear campaigns. And we've just seen that last uh, week happening in the EU parliament and also in Germany, where these people meet with our Minister of Interior without the Foreign Office even being present there. Um, there are more issues that are relevant for these divisions that increase among EU member states. I just want to mention two more. One is, of course, you have mentioned it also, Isam, uh, the Trump administration's policies. As we have some member states that have very close relations with the US and that look uh, more towards the US in terms of security partnership than others. Um, yes. Um, the, the more divisive US policies become, uh, the more divided Europeans also become. And the last but very important factor is the rise of right-wing parties, coalitions and governments in Europe. Uh, coalitions that often share a lot of values with the government of Israel, that seek the alliance with the government of Israel, um, because of the shared values on the one hand, but also uh, because that kind of relation serves at white, as a means of whitewashing them against accusations of anti-Semitism. And we see that uh, very strongly in the country I stem from, where we have uh, a right-wing right -wing movement that is begging Israel to accept it, uh, and in that, uh, attempt um, does all kinds of things in favor of Israel, for example, establishing a caucus in the European Parliament called the Caucus for Judea and Samaria. Um, as a consequence of these divisions, what we see today uh, is that uh, the EU is not active and cannot come to common stances um, it doesn't mean that they are not consulting in different formats, but they're not able to come up with statements that are supported by the E28, only in very rare circumstances, and they don't have the capacity actually to push policies forward and present anything um, that would be, well, an alternative to the current approaches of others in the international community. I don't have uh, much time left, but I want to still look forward a little bit. Um, we will have a new high representative um, replacing Mogherini next month, uh, Josep Borrell, uh, the Spanish foreign minister. He's a socialist. He is considered uh, much more open to Palestinian um, ambitions and aspirations. Um, I would expect for him to be more active on Israel-Palestine and I would still be very hesitant to think that that would change the overall picture that I've been trying to give here. Why is that? Uh, basically, again, three reasons very shortly. Uh, one is that the workings of the EU uh, that have nothing to do with the Middle East uh, just don't allow the Europeans to focus on that problem for the time being. Um, and that is linked to the second one that this problem, the situation here 
is not a foreign policy priority at all in Europe today. It's not. Um, and the third one is that the policies of the government of Israel that I've been just describing um, are, I think, uh, set to go on. And the institutional structure that has been put in place in Europe through these anti-Semitism coordinators and the allied uh, lobby organizations um, will see to it that it will become ever more problematic uh, to have a reasonable discussion in Europe about the situation here and the way forward. And that unfortunately uh, brings us to a situation where what um, Muda said in his uh, entry, in, in his introductory words, is, um, is not going to be fulfilled in the sense that um, constructive change is not going to come from Europe. If you look for somebody to induce that, uh, don't, look, don't look to Europe. Um, the EU might be a partner for stabilization, it will not be a partner for liberation.